Uh, so this is about the methodology for benchmarking and with my uh, colleague Ian Young um, at Intel. Um, what I would like to talk about is that uh, mainly about beyond CMOS devices, uh, which are envisioned as um, components for the neural networks and neuromorphic chips. Uh, we are coming from <clears throat> uh, that side of uh, device physics and circuit design into the uh, neuromorphic um, stage. And for us, it's more of a learning exercise. Uh, we uh, <clears throat> have accomplished a consistent methodology for benchmarking of the Boolean digital uh, logic, and we'll be trying to extend it to now uh, neural computing. Um, <clears throat> so then, first of all, um, uh, this is the neural gate, the perceptron, which is very familiar to, all, to you all. Um, I understand this is a, a very restrictive view at the neuromorphic computing, but we'll still um, adopt this scheme that most of our networks will be consisting of uh, cascaded uh, perceptrons. Um, and uh, so we'll think of it not just as an element of an algorithm, but more of the building block uh, for circuits. So there will be synapses and neurons that we will uh, implement with various uh, types of hardware. So speaking of the neurons, <coughs> there are of course, the well-known uh, existing um, implementations of that, digital or analog CMOS. And there are beyond CMOS various uh, devices, mostly based on the nanomagnetic devices, magnetoelectric, ferroelectric, and so forth. In that uh, prior work on the benchmarking of the uh, beyond CMOS devices for Boolean computing, what we were doing is um, coming up with the uh, <clears throat> theoretical estimates of the physical parameters, area, delay, and energy for devices, and then building up uh, circuits hierarchically, going to NAND, gates, adders, all the way to uh, ALU, arithmetic logic unit. So these are the references for, for this work. We'll try to do the same uh, in this case. So then, uh, disclaimer, what we mean by benchmarking is a uh, theoretical framework for estimates of various types of uh, devices, how they will perform in neural computing, and not benchmarking of algorithms, such as what AlexNet versus ResNet, and not um, <coughs> actual experimental uh, benchmarking of running certain algorithms on the hardware, as uh, Peter will uh, tell you in the next talk. So this is <coughs> what we mean by, by benchmarking. So also there are uh, synapses. There are even more types of possible synapses. Again, known <coughs> uh, CMOS-based synapses are <coughs> drawn on the top. And then we looked at various uh, papers and researchers proposed various types of synapses also based on beyond CMOS devices. We'll be aiming to <coughs> use the estimates of how each of these uh, devices um, performs in terms of energy, delay and, ener uh, and area, and uh, building up the circuits from that level. <clears throat> so overall, one can combine various types of uh, neurons and synapses. Uh, some of them will be digital, shown in uh, yellow. Uh, many of them will be beyond CMOS, um, shown here in the blue color. But overall, that um, makes up a lot of combinations of the um, <clears throat> uh, neurons and synapses. We've come up with a way of labeling them all. Uh, so then, well, uh, you will have to grapple with a lot of uh, possible combinations uh, that can be envis envisioned uh, for synapses and neurons. Let's look at a few of them. Um, <clears throat> one popular way is um, the crossbar of resistive elements or membristors. But in a, at every uh, crossing of the bar, there is a resistor. And the resistor can be represented by various means, oxide membristor, or phase change memory, or uh, floating gate, or magnetic ram, and so forth. Uh, so these are synapses. And the neurons are some kind of reading circuits, adders, and shift registers. 
So what we'll be doing is um, um, looking how many uh, transistors there are, um, how, what's the critical path through them, and estimating the time and energy that's required to, for operation of these circuits. Um, well, the <clears throat> that's not the only possible way. Uh, the group of Professor Roy at Purdue uh, proposed the crossbar array based on uh, nanomagnetic devices with motion of the main walls. As the domain's wall walls move, the resistance of synapses changes. And also, as the domain walls move, uh, the neurons, they perform summation of the inputs, and they perform the thresholding function. Again, sorry, don't have time um, to go in the detail of its operation, just showing you the variety of possibilities. Uh, the, our development of that uh, domain wall idea is the magnetoelectric uh, synapses and neurons. And the main difference of, uh, between the, this one and the previous slide is that here the um, magnetization in these synapses and neurons is, switching by, is being switched by the magnetoelectric effect. And we've uh, learned from our prior work that this is a more uh, energy efficient way uh, to switch magnetic devices. So then with, uh, th these are just three out of 17 varieties of neurons and synapses. So then, um, but that doesn't stop with that. Uh, there are various types of networks that uh, people envisioned. And there is artificial neural network on, we, can call it analog neural network. There is a cellular neural network, which is very similar to the uh, ANN, with uh, additional constraint that neurons and the neurons are put on the rectangular grid, and synapses are connecting each neuron with just a few of the nearest neighbors. These two types of networks, uh, they um, have the signals which are monotonically more or less varying, and um, um, <clears throat> the signal is encoded by the value uh, of the signal, uh, voltage or current. In contrast to that, there are spiking neural networks where the um, um, inputs and outputs are encoded as the <coughs> rates of spiking or uh, timing of spikes. And then there have been proposed oscillator neural networks, where synapses are implemented as oscillators. There is a common node to which they are all connected. The oscillators start with um, a variety of frequencies. And then depending on the coupling between them and depending on the distribution of the frequencies, they either synchronize to one frequency or they don't synchronize. And synchronization corresponds to a recognition of the pattern and lack of Synchronization corresponds to the absence of recognition. We'll also aim to um, make estimates, benchmarking estimates for all these four types of networks. Okay, so then um, the way we do that is we have the, uh, we start with the values for the time and energy for each of the devices and then build it up uh, to the full. Uh, neural gate, for example, by summing the delay through the synapse and delay through the neuron. And we obtain the energy by uh, summing the energy of operation of each of the synapses and each of the neurons. So then with, uh, uh, save for um, a lot of um, gory details, this is in essence the procedure of how we approach that. For the cellular neural networks, there has been, have been a prior work by Professor Naimi's group at Georgia Tech, and we've uh, subsumed uh, their uh, methodology as a part of ours. So this is how this class of uh, neural networks is being benchmarked. Uh, for the spiking neural networks, there is a certain duration of the spike. Uh, we uh, assume a certain uh, duration between the spikes and its ratio to the uh, spike uh, time. And we also assume the, that it takes a certain amount of uh, spikes for the neuron to fire. 
So that is more <coughs> reminiscent of the rate-based coding. Um, I was uh, told by multiple people that temporal coding is more efficient, and we are working on uh, including that in our framework as well. And finally, isolated neural networks, uh, is the, the treatment of them is based on the determination of the certain uh, synchronization time. Uh, that is typically a few of the periods of, synchronization, of oscillation. And uh, then calculating the power that re is required to run oscillators. And then the energy of uh, synapse is um, power of the oscillator uh, times the time of synchronization. So putting that all together, um, so we are also looking at various types of oscillators. Again, there are oscillators based on the CMOS. And then most of other proposed oscillators that researchers all over the world are working on are uh, beyond CMOS. Um, <clears throat> well, my personal favorite is spin transfer torque oscillator because it's um, <clears throat> closer uh, to commercialization. So uh, multiple groups are working on that. But there are various other piezoelectric, magnetoelectric oscillators, so forth. Now, if we put uh, these estimates all together, in terms of what the energy and the delay is, we'll get uh, the certain picture for synapses. I'm painfully aware that it's just a chaos of dots for you at the moment. Uh, but, um, well, let me make some sense of them. Um, in magenta, these are ANNs. Uh, green are cellular neural networks. Uh, blue are oscillator neural networks. And orange are spiking neural networks. On the average, they have approximately the same range of energy, but they vary in the delay. Well, which, uh, uh, well, to me it was surprising, but to you it probably wouldn't be surprising because uh, last, in the last conference, Johannes um, showed a slide which was saying, well, there is the way to run uh, his chip in the spiking mode, and then there is a way to run it in perceptron mode, like a Hagen chip, and the second was faster. Uh, the uh, operations were happening faster than the uh, spiking. So that um, benchmarking in essence reflects uh, that fact. So now, am I uh, saying, uh, well, uh, do I agree with what uh, Mike was saying before about uh, spiking neural network networks and uh, a lot of their attractive features? Yes, I absolutely agree. Uh, but the benchmarking is not the whole truth, it's just a facet of the truth. It's like accounting, doing how many inference you do per unit time. So accounting is not the whole representation of your business, but it's not the reason not to do accounting. So then there is still something, some things to learn out of doing the accounting. So then the four synapses, there is no such clear separation. So there are, in general, there are ANN, SNN uh, synapses. Uh, <clears throat> what one can see from them is mostly that uh, synapses based on the resistive um, memories, uh, they are lower energy and faster. And synapses based on max, of course, they are uh, slower and uh, larger energy. And the reason for that is MAC is a circuit with thousands of transistors and um, it takes longer to do a digital MAC and uh, it takes more energy. So then again, <clears throat> it's an unsurprising result about that. So now, uh, these were still on the level of neurons and synapses. So let's try to build up some neural network out of them. And we'll take, for example, one of the convolutional neural networks, LENET5. And Mike keeps telling me that um, <coughs> convolutional neural networks are not the best ones to show off the advantage of spiking neural networks. And I agree with that. But since a lot of people are using convolutional neural networks, we chose that as our first um, <clears throat> benchmarking example. Of course, one needs to extend it to other ones. But even if we speak about uh, speech processing that Peter would 
I will speak about in the next talk, this too is based on some sort of deep neural network, just as this convolutional neural network is the implementation of a deep neural network for images. So this convolutional neural network has convolutional stages, which are sparse, and then fully connected stages. Um, for each of these stages, uh, we are aiming to uh, perform it in a neural core, which has the input, input neurons, output neurons, and synapses in between. So then um, there could be several topologies of how you connect neurons with uh, synapses. The most straightforward is the crossbar topology. It's perfect for the fully connected stages of the network, but for convolutional neural networks it will be inefficient because convolutions are sparse. One can come up with a di different topology, con convolutional topology we will call it, where the spatial sparseness is enforced by design. Of course, that would make it uh, much less general, but it will probably be more efficient. So what we envision is designing the circuits for this specifically uh, convolutional neural network consisting of multiple stages. And each stage and each filter of the stage will be represented by a neural core. So these are scores of neural cores to implement this whole convolutional neural network. Uh, for some of the uh, neurons, uh, they uh, admit um, very high values of phenin. Well, for example, spiking neural networks are good in the sense that they naturally take a lot of phenin. Um, digital NACs, they are not good at phenin. Uh, for example, looking at the now chip, uh, they require uh, just two phenins, and so then you need to cascade the additions of these uh, synapses and do it in multiple stages of cascading. So we've also incorporated this fact of cascading in our network, in our treatment. Another feature that a lot of people insisted should be um, incorporated uh, rigorously are the interconnects. So then the um, spikes or um, switching events need to be in general translated over ra rather large distances. And uh, the way we treated interconnects for Boolean uh, computing was simple, that there is a certain capacitance uh, per the length of the interconnect, there is certain resistance of the elements, and uh, we can calculate what the capacitance per unit length is. We can compare it with experimental measurements from the true north chip and see that the energy uh, of transmitting a pulse per bit depends on the voltage and depends on the distance, which is very much in line with this analytic estimate. <coughs> and we can obtain what the effective capacitance per length of these interconnects is. So we are using that. So all this was bottoms-up benchmarking from devices to more complicated circuits. We can also look at uh, published research chips, and uh, uh, we'll um, separate them into classes. Digital neural accelerators. These are ANN type of networks, and they consist, in essence, of multiple uh, MAC units as synapses. And, uh, um, We've collected the data on them from the literature, and if some of them are wrong, then I would really appreciate you pointing it out. Uh, an example of this chip would be uh, Google's TPU. The main uh, part of this chip is, in essence, a matrix multiplier. At each uh, node of the crossbar, there is a MAC, unit multiply and accumulate. Um, so then, uh, but note that this is not the only part. There are a lot of auxiliary circuits for um, fetching the data for the control of the execution. But in general, um, 
the publications quote what synaptics throughput. So then it means that there are a number of synapses. The synapses fire with a certain rate, and that produces the certain synaptic throughput. And uh, there is an energy for the uh, synapse to operate, and that determines what the power is going to be. So we will, these values of the firing rate and energy per synapse is, uh, are the values that we can use directly in our benchmarking. Similar thing uh, can be applied to what we'll call neuromorphic chips. These are spiking neural networks. There is a multiple uh, <clears throat> publications on that. And again, uh, we went through the publications and to the best of our ability extracted what the claimed energy per synapse is, what the synaptic throughput is, what the power is, and used that as well in uh, our benchmarking. And this is an example of uh, True North. And then you see that there are cores. There are multiple cores that are put on the grid. Uh, for e each of these cores, we, uh, by reading the papers, we extract what the values of the energy per synapse is and uh, <clears throat> uh, throughput. So putting that all together, uh, we'll compare the bottoms up benchmarks for the uh, Lynette example. Again, there is a similar situation. The ANNs are a bit faster. The spiking neural networks are a bit slower. Max are more energy hungry and uh, slower than all of them, regardless of whether they are spiking or not. And we can compare it with tops down benchmarking extracted from the chips. So the red are neuromorphic chips. The yellow are digital neural accelerators. Even within each class, we see that some of them are operating at a slower rate, and some, for example, Loihi, are operating at much faster rate and lower energy. And uh, we see that while well, the energy of operation is higher, that just carries the simple thought that lower power cheap chips at a longer operation time don't translate into lower energy. So then, uh, <clears throat> Another interesting uh, observation about these chips is that uh, the area uh, for the neuromorphic chips is smaller than for the neural accelerators because, again, as we mentioned, max are large. So then um, you can squeeze fewer neurons and synapses into these digital neural accelerators. Um, these neuromorphic chips uh, are um, of the same order of magnitude as our estimates from bottoms up circuits. So then all of that is of interest to device physicists and circuit designers, but what's of interest to consumers is the following, the how much power per unit area you get and how many synaptic operations uh, you do per unit time. And from this, um, consideration, we see the following, uh, that um, neural accelerators are lower in power and throughput, mainly because they are large circuits. Uh, neuromorphic chips, uh, they are um, high in energy, sometimes at comparable uh, throughput, mainly because they are more compact circuits. And um, uh, the, our um, bottoms, up estimates for the ANNs and the SNNs, uh, they at approximately the same order of magnitude of power, they um, would produce larger um, inference throughput, mainly because they are set to run faster than the other neuromorphic chips. So then, with all of that uh, disclaimers, we were only looking at uh, inferences, and I'm well aware of the importance of learning, but first we needed to start with something simple and <clears throat> get it right before we turn to learning. And secondly, the, um, our interleaders, they are considering inference and learning as two separate market segments uh, for chips. So then it's probably okay to first look at the inferences. 
Okay, so then in summary, I've told you about interesting beyond CMOS devices such as Spintronic, which are promising for the future uh, neural networks. Uh, I told you about our approach to benchmarking methodology and the uh, results uh, coming from this methodology. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri, for really keeping perfect in time. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, I have another announcement to make to uh, have a little bit more coffee. And uh, Brad volunteered to shift this talk to the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So we have 10 minutes more time that uh, have been already used up by Mike. <laughs> so we are now in time again. <laughs> OK, that was what you meant, all right? Do I have a question? Yeah, the question is the next thing. <laughs> OK, so we go to the, I just didn't want to forget this. So now we go to the questions for Dimitri's talk. You are first, Brad. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chris. So the very, this is very interesting. And I guess um, maybe the takeaway I take as a algorithm developer for spiking neural networks is that it's not enough just to switch to spiking mm -hmm. um, based on your analysis. That if spiking is going to convey an advantage, the algorithms need to be retailored to leverage that. Like you can't just translate a conventional algorithm into spiking, you know, with a rate mm -hmm. code or whatever, and hope that it's going to work. Because it's not. Is that yes, I, I agree. Then uh, one needs to look at. Um, um, algorithms which are uniquely suited for spiking, and uh, Mike was mentioning some of them, like our factory um, uh, signal treatment or lasso optimization. But in, a, in general, yes, you're right. A lot of people will have ANNs based on the memories to crossbars, and if you just translate their algorithms to spiking, then you probably would not win compared to them. And by spiking, you mean like a rate code? rate or temporal uh, code because still seems like uh, in general it's they are slower uh, than um, ANNs. I was just curious to know if uh, what where do you think real biological neurons and synapses would be on your on your graphs? <laughs> um, okay. Um, so then, uh, in terms of area delay. Um, so for the delay, they would be um, approximately, well, uh, so then uh, in similar delay as uh, some of these neuromorphic chips, because they are deliberately ran at the biologically plausible rates. In terms of area, there would be probably um, per, if you calculate uh, transfer volume of the brain into a effective area, then probably somewhat smaller area. He deserves another question because he kept his time so well. Um, okay, Johannes. Mike. So two very important properties I, I believe you haven't worked into this framework. Uh, mm -hmm. One is the increasing sparseness through the layers of the convolutional network that I don't think you've, you've modeled, which mm -hmm. the spiking neural networks will take advantage of. And then secondly, the cost of memory access for uh, deep neural network accelerators. Yes, the, that's correct. Uh, then memory is uh, not been included. So then, so far, what is being done is just a, a pipeline of processing. As far as sparseness, um, I would say partially. So then, the, the um, spatial sparseness, meaning in terms of uh, how many um, input uh, neurons connected to how many synapses, is uh, being uh, utilized by uh, making this more efficient topology of the connection. Um, right. that, spa uh, that temporal that sparseness, no. Well, I mean, it, it's, um, Activ it's included. Activity sparseness. Exactly. Yes, it, it's un That's included in the sense that uh, spiking neural networks, they are um, assumed that a certain um, uh, temporal sparseness. What, what factor do you assume, and, and how do you assume that changes through the, through the layers of the network? Um, it, well, it's uh, not changing at the, uh, through the networks, and it's assumed uh, one-tenth of uh, spatial sparseness. So then the spikes on the, on the average and one-tenth of the uh, temporal intervals. Right, right. So, so I, would, I would recommend, it, 
uh -huh. improving that aspect of it, since the Absolutely. sparseness actually does increase in these deep neural networks mapped to spiking form as you go through the layers. Okay. I'll, we I'll may even have some talks. I need to get the, details yes. from you on that. Okay. Thank you again, Dimitri. Okay.